how does a shotgun end up like this? How did England become the epicentre of driven game shooting? And how do we get pheasants from field to fork? Some of the questions that I'm going to be talking about today. We had a local school come to see us this week and we invited the year 10s who are in the process of doing their GCSE in food technology. And we discussed with them all of these things and the basics of driven game shooting. And I thought it might be interesting to you guys. So we'll start with the history. So what's, what makes a game bird? Well, a game bird is something that is a wild bird. It may well have been bred in captivity and released into the wild, but it is not farmed per se. A farmed bird would be held within a captive area. It may well free range, but a farmed bird would be within a perimetered area. Whereas a game bird is free once it's a certain age to go out in the wild and go wherever it likes, including crossing roads, farms, and they can literally free roam. We've got four real key species of game bird in this country that are shot in a driven sense. We have grouse, pheasant, partridge and duck. Grouse cannot be reared and it's not something that we have down in the south. So I am not going to discuss grouse today. We're going to be focusing on what we have down in the south of England, which is pheasant, partridge and duck. Historically, we would have had grouse down here, but they're a moorland bird and down here we only really have Dartmoor and Exmoor and those are now obsolete of grouse, something that you'll find higher up in England and Scotland. So let's look at the origins of the gun and how game shooting came about. Originally, game shooting would have been with bow and arrow, so not shooting as we know it. However, it would have been just somebody going out and shooting the odd bird for the pot. Around the 1600s, guns were invented. Only muzzle-loaded guns, though. And that meant that both the ammunition and the gunpowder had to be put down the barrel and compacted into the gun. And it was a lengthy process. So you only had one shot at a time. Because of that, driven shooting, as we now know it, would not have been possible. So it was what you call walked-up shooting. A man would go out with his dog, and he would walk up a hedgerow and when a bird flushed out, he would take a shot and it would go back to the pot. Around the 1800s, guns evolved and we got what we call the side by side. And here's a side by side. The breakthrough in having side by side guns came because somebody invented the cartridge. The cartridge could go into the barrel and as the gun would be opened, the cartridges would eject. And that would mean that you could reload your gun a lot more quickly. At the time, all of the guns were side by sides. Very obvious because the barrels are side by side. Those guns were breech loaded. So as I showed, two cartridges would go into the gun and then as you opened it, they would be released. That allowed the speed of shooting to pick up massively. You were already loading a pre-ready cartridge and not having to muzzle load all of the items individually into your gun. And they then ejected themselves as well. So as time went on, the landed gentry, those that had big estates, started to shoot more and bigger bags. And they started to want to shoot more. And that led to the rise of the gamekeeper. They would have a gamekeeper and they would start to release birds and they would release birds and drive those birds over the guns. And it went from the gun walking the bird up to the gun actually staying static on the day with the gamekeeper, his beating team, those that push the birds forwards, and the picking up team, those that retrieve the birds, being the ones that walk, but the guns staying in a static place as the birds flushed over them. In that era, it was all about the bag. It was not about the sporting quality of the bird. It was about big bags and showing that you had the ability to have a driven shoot on your estate. Around the 1960s, other people started to become interested in game shooting. They may be wealthy businessmen or people that had been on the periphery. In the time of the landed gentry when they were shooting, it really was the landed gentry inviting their other estate neighbours who would invite another estate neighbour and in turn they would be invited back and it really was a closed circle of people that shot. But as people became more wealthy and businessmen became interested in shooting, people started to rent 
other ground. So they would rent off of farmers or potentially the person that owned the estate wasn't interested in shooting themselves and they would rent out their estate for somebody else to run a shoot. So we went from people that were wealthy enough to go shooting to those that were rich enough. You didn't have to be wealthy enough to own the land, you just had to be rich enough to rent it or rich enough to pay for a day or a peg to be able to shoot on someone else's ground. And that led to a boom in shooting. And moving forward, the guns became more sophisticated. And with that came in to more popularity and the invention of the over and under. The over and under being where the barrels are one over the other. And your sight is much better because you're looking down the side of the barrels. This led to more accurate shooting and therefore the drive for more sporting birds. So your typical shotgun cartridge would probably be a 12 bore like this. That contains 225 small ball bearing type pellets inside it and they are fired out of the gun through the air creating what we call a pattern and that pattern spreads these with the view that the further away from the gun it goes the wider the pattern will be. That wasn't a big issue in Victorian times because the birds were low and it was all about quantity not quality but as times moved on people have become more interested in shooting higher birds, more sporting birds. And with that, the invention of the choke came. Now, I'm going to be honest, I do not know the ins and outs of choking. There are plenty of people that are far more up on all of that. However, the basic concept of it is that one would put a choke inside the gun that holds the pattern that will enable you to shoot a closer pattern at the correct type of bird. There are plenty of other things involved in cartridges as well. The amount of ammo in, which can change the amount of kick that you get, etc. But in absolute basics, the choke was invented to allow that pattern to be brought in because at 60 yards, a wide pattern, you may have a, a bearing here and a bearing there and the bird could fly through straight through the middle. The theory being it brings that together and therefore you've got more chance of downing that bird and making it a clean hit. 12 ball guns though are not your only option. There are others. There's the 410, which is particularly small. There's the 20 ball, which is a key choice for maybe ladies and some older people that can't cope with the kick or potentially the weight of a 12 ball gun. And then there are others like the 16 ball. And this will show you the slight difference between the two. One being a smaller cartridge than the other this being the 16 ball and this being the 12 ball. And as you saw at the beginning of the video, with that comes a hazard. You never ever can mix your cartridges. If you loaded a smaller cartridge by accident into a larger cartridge gun, it can get stuck in the chamber. When you then put your other cartridge in behind, not potentially realizing that you have added another cartridge because you didn't see it eject, you can blow the side of your barrel out. This is a decommissioned gun that we use as a fantastic demonstrator for anybody that is not aware of what is going into their cartridge bag. But it really goes to show the danger of shooting and how you mustn't ever mix your balls. So we've talked about how shooting came about. However, we need to get birds onto a shoot for them to be shot. Now, grouse shooting, Again, I'm not going to talk about that. That's a moorland based thing and that's a very different subject. When we're talking about pheasant, duck and partridge, they are a bird that are released into the wild. But the wild is not the wild that we or they would have known a thousand years ago. We look out now across the landscape at a perfectly manicured country. The hedges are maintained, the woodland is maintained and the fields are maintained. And the key difference is we no longer have wolves. They have been eradicated. So part of what a gamekeeper would do would be to look after the and control the population of things like foxes, things like squirrels, where they can do damage to the woodland that the birds might be going into and maintain that balance. One of the things that the gamekeeper will do will be to look after the birds and the environment that they're in, which also means looking after and controlling vermin, be it rats, 
foxes, or even the grey squirrel that is damaging the habitat in our woodlands. And with that, we'll briefly touch on rifles. So we have rounds like the 2-2, which are perfect for rats and rabbits. Then about 10 years ago, they brought in the 1-7, which is very slightly longer than this. And that is a great round for small animals. We've got a triple two, super for foxing round. And the minimum deer requirement round is a 243, which is a little bit bigger than this. Those bullets are traveling at such a fast speed that the reality is by the time the animal has heard the bang, it's actually already dead. So it couldn't have heard the bang, but you get my theory. And in addition to this, the change in that landscape means that we are planting more cereals. We also have more animals grazing and that has changed how birds in the game sense would potentially feed. So we now grow a large quantity of cover crops in this country. A cover crop being an area specifically planted for the game bird to eat in. We'll have a pen built usually in woodland because that's where the birds like to roost. The birds will be released into the pen when they're young and they would have that as their sanctuary. Now, you might be thinking, well, you said that a farmed animal is in a pen and a game bird's a wild animal. Once they are able to fly and defend themselves to a degree, then they will be able to leave that pen and they need never go back. Only 30% of most birds released in the country on your average shoot is ever going to be shot, which means 70% go off and do whatever they do. They may be living in someone's garden, for all we know. They just disappear off and they go and live their own lives. So those birds are released into that pen and they can then leave that pen of their own free will. And the aim of the gamekeeper is actually to guide them up to the cover crop that he has put in. You'll see on some of my other videos that I talk about different types of cover crop. There's loads of them out there. But that cover crop is planted specifically as food for those birds. That's another key element that the gamekeeper would be doing during his year. So throughout the year, those birds have been released into this pen. They've been looked after in the pen by the gamekeeper and they have been drawn out into those cover crops. So that on a shoot day, the beating team, that's the people that will be with the gamekeeper and will work as a cohesive unit will bring the birds in a very gentle fashion to flush over the gun line. And as we said, these guns have come on in leaps and bounds. So that, that gun line is a static element. They aren't moving anywhere. They are gonna stay in their place for the entire drive. And that, those birds will fly over that gun line. At the back, you'll have the people that are picking up with the dogs. You'll have seen my videos, that's usually me. And we're there picking up the birds so that nothing goes to waste and they go in the bag. Now, a British shoot day is a surprisingly formal affair. Usually the guns, the term that we give to the people that are shooting, would turn up in the morning for coffee or maybe breakfast, where they will then draw pegs. Pegs are the number at which you would stand. So usually on a shoot, a driven game shoot in England, you would have between eight and ten guns. We have a line of nine. So if I use nine as an example, you would pull a number out, given the options of one to nine. You don't know which one you're going to take. You turn it over and you will see where you're going to stand for your first drive. Most shoots would do somewhere between four and five drives in a day. As you arrive at the first drive, if you had pulled peg five, you're going to be roughly in the middle or on a nine gun line, you would be the middle all the way up to one on one end and nine on the other. And the gamekeeper is aiming to drive the bird through the central belt. So three, four, five and six will have the most shooting. One, two, seven, eight and nine will probably be slightly further out of it. In order to allow fairness, then at the end of each drive, you would move up a given number. So on a nine gun line, you may move up two. On an eight gun line, you may move up three. So that you are mixing between the center of the line and the edge of the line, allowing for variety and a different opportunity to have slightly different birds or be in the center of it, be on the outside of it. And you might be thinking that with nine people stood in a field or holding a gun or a woodland, that it could be a dangerous affair. It's surprisingly rigid how the day works. 99% of shoots in the United Kingdom will not allow ground game. 
i.e. no shooting of anything on the ground. You can only shoot something in the air. So that means no rabbits, no hares, etc. And you would need to be conscious of the etiquette of the day, which would involve not shooting your neighbour's bird. So if a bird is coming along the line, it would be the person to your right hand side's turn first at that bird if it was coming from your right. If the bird is coming straight towards you, you have a window that creates that bird being your bird. It would be really poor etiquette to swing and shoot over the other side of your neighbour. Some people may share a bird because it's somewhere in that middle ground, but really you should be shooting your own birds and that is a key etiquette. But also it does make it a safer day because everyone is only shooting in the air in a given space and it's all very regimented in how it's done. The beating team and the picking up team are usually a fair distance away from the guns and at the end of a drive is normally signalled on most shoots by a horn or a whistle. At the point that that horn or whistle goes, the guns are required to unload their guns, pack them back into their sleeves. And usually if they've got a dog, they'll help out with some picking up or they may well just move on and go on to have 11's ears or talk about the drive before they move on to the next one. And a drive is one section. So that would be one lined out set of guns, one cover crop driven through, one lot of picking up. And then you would repeat it again four to five times throughout the day, having four to five drives as the day goes on. And I imagine you're thinking, well, this seems very far divorced from the day where there was man with bow and arrow. And in many ways, it is. Nowadays, people shoot less for the pot and more potentially for the sport. However, it is key that all of those birds go into the pot. There are many a rumour out there of people that are not putting their birds in the pot. It's not a problem that we've ever had. In fact, we actually have a queue of people waiting for our birds. And occasionally, if necessary, we would send them to a game dealer. There's game dealers throughout the country. And there are even charities now that will take those birds, like the Country Food Trust, and turn them in to ready mills for homeless people. It's really key that we don't lose that element. I can entirely understand that somebody coming home with birds in the feather, potentially, and I don't want to sound sexist, husbands to their wife, whose wife looks at it and thinks, I haven't got time for this, I've got other stuff to do, I don't really want to be dealing with all the guts and the gore and the bits and pieces. That can be off-putting. But there are plenty of shoots out there now that are offering ready-to-eat game, those that are vacuum-packed, breasted out birds, or feeding it back to the guns and the beaters and the pickers up on a shoot day like we do. A percentage of our birds go back to the beaters and guns at the end of the day and the pickers. A percentage of our birds are fed to everyone the following week. And a percentage of our birds go to local people, at local restaurants, the local school, etc. We mustn't ever let that element become too far divorced from the day that man went out with bow and arrow.